Today, I'm going to talk about um, a concept that has uh, increasingly consumed my time and energy, uh, which is the topic of gaming addiction. Um, and uh, I, I hope to share what I've learned about it in the last five or so years um, with you. So first, who am I? Uh, well, what am I, I guess? I'm an experimental psychologist, so um, I, uh, was, I originally trained as the kind of psychologist that helps people, um, but then I was approached uh, by my PhD supervisor who had the idea that maybe uh, we could use empirical psychology, quantitative psychology, uh, to study video games and to study benchmarking and game development. So I co-developed the PENS, which is an application of motivational theory uh, to game development. That's a player experience and need satisfaction uh, approach. Um, I'm most interested in um, behavior, uh, physiology, and human motivation. And this kind of encompasses kind of small scale data, things in the lab, things you think of as play testing, and large scale or big data, following tens of thousands of people uh, over time with behavioral data, with trace data, with survey data. And um, I'm increasingly interested in evidence-based policy making. So basically, if you're a lawmaker, or if you're a regulator, or if you're in charge of an education or health system, how do you make a decision on the basis of scientific knowledge um, about technology specifically uh, in a way that kind of conforms to or is, uh, uh, harmonizes um, with what we know from science? Um, I'm, I, I was also born in 1982, so I'm really in the sweet spot uh, for having played uh, the uh, original Nintendo. Um, and so uh, this was my present on my seventh birthday. So why am I here? What are the kinds of things I'm gonna talk about? Well, uh, I'm sure that, that everyone in the room has, has uh, 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 tiny bits or large bits or chunks of an idea about what gaming addiction is. I'm gonna try to cover these five topics. I'm gonna start by trying to offer somewhat of a historic perspective on concerns about games and addiction in particular. I'm gonna talk about kind of what is the philosophical or, or theoretical position that's required uh, uh, to kind of understand what gaming addiction is. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the different classes and the different kinds of scientific evidence that, that uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, epidemiologists, and some kinds of sociologists kind of apply to the question of gaming addiction. There's just, every time I use the word addiction, you're allowed to just put giant quotes around that word. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the direction, the trajectory that I see things going if nobody in the industry changes uh, their current behavior sets, what the end game is going to be. And I'm gonna try, time permitting, to be somewhat optimistic and offer an alternative vision that uh, doesn't involve plowing into the side of a mountain. So to start, um, for some historic perspective to kind of zoom out in terms of um, how we see our concerns about games. Um, concerns about games are, are very certainly not new. Um, the first documented case I could find of a, of a relatively popular game was in the New York Times in the mid-1970s. There was a game called Death Race. It was an arcade game, a, a coin-operated arcade game, uh, wherein uh, I think it was a two-player game. Uh, you, you drove around killing these gremlins, and then every time you killed a gremlin, there was a, a, a little tombstone, and then you had to avoid the, all the tombstones of all the gremlins you killed, and then keep running down gremlins. Any case, the coverage of, of this concern, of this game, is basically the template for everything that we've observed in the subsequent 40 years, 40 plus years, of uh, video game media coverage. So we have an active ingredient, for our concern, and, and this is a pretty common one for different video game concerns, it's that games are interactive, all right? That's the thing that sets them apart from a different form of media. That's the, that's the thing that makes them qualitatively different. In some way, when people play games, they, they practice and act in a fantasy environment that generalizes either through confusion or desensitization. It, their, their experience in this virtual environment kind of gets m mixed up with or, or written over uh, uh, what they would have otherwise uh, developed as, as a person if they had never played Death Race 2000. Um, and, then, and then when we're talking about the effects of games on people, we typically identify a, a vulnerable party. They're typically not a 36-year-old 
straight white guy. Um, there's some other group of people, depending on the kind of media, it might be children, it might be migrants, it might be women, um, really depending on the different kind of media that we've had a concern about, uh, there's always a vulnerable group. If the effects aren't obvious on, the, uh, on an individual level, an argument gets made that on the societal level, the effect must be significant. In, in this one specifically, um, the expert that they brought in, um, he said that this would lead to a higher level of pedestrian traffic fatalities. But that's always, but with these kinds of concerns, there's always one of these things that even if there isn't a clear, you know, transitive rock A scratches rock B, rock, rock B scratches rock C, so then A on C, um, there's some kind of probabilistic notion that happens across the whole population. And then I apologize, most of the time that an expert weighs in, um, they are a psychologist, um, just because we're so fancy. Um, and, and they always end in free advertising for the game developer. Um, this one closes with, but Mr. Brooks was unfazed. Every time a story comes out, he said, we get more and more orders. So I think these, these cabinets sold for about $1,000 each. So concerns about violent video games, um, and I, I, I promise I won't labor this too much, I have a point. Um, depending on how you, how you slice the data, you actually could think that violent video games were positively associated with youth crime uh, for some period of time between death race uh, and, and when I got my N Nintendo. Um, but then other things happened in society. And so from like the mid-90s until the, the, the present era, there's almost a perfect negative correlation um, between teen crime and violent video game sales in the United States. So there are some classes of evidence that relate to concerns that, some, that in some cases can ameliorate them, at least for certain po parts of the population. But addiction's a little bit different. So when we talk about addiction in technology or addiction in games, interactivity is still a feature of it. But actually, in, in a weird way, it's both a younger set of concerns and a more static set of concerns. So in the same way that, that interactivity is important uh, for both, the, 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 the mode or the model or the lens that we see technology addiction or gaming addiction through um, is, is intrinsically different because there is a model that already existed for us to think about gaming addiction. So in the, in the late 1990s, there was a psychiatrist called Ivan Goldberg. He's one of New York's leading addiction researchers. And he was so frustrated with the medical model of addiction that as an act of satire on a, on a uh, email list, on a listserv, he actually created gaming, uh, he created internet addiction. And he just like, kind of like took the checklist approach and just like point out how silly psychiatrists had been about pathologizing all these normal parts of life. Uh, in the late 90s, apparently the internet was still a part of life. Um, though maybe it wasn't as fun. Uh, and he was shocked because actually it turned real. People started coming to him with their imagined or real uh, uh, problems with technology addiction. And so really what's going on here, th this is kind of one of many indicators that the challenge that we might face with dealing with concerns or thinking about concerns about aggression are, are very different than what we see with addiction. So we can compare these on kind of a direct basis. So when we talk about violent games, we actually have a pretty poor fitting model from social science to describe the effects that we would expect. But when we talk about addiction to games, we have a pre-existing model, a mold. People have been studying addiction for a very long time, so there's an easy fit, at least in terms of, of a lot of the language and a lot of the assumptions. Um, for violent games, there's a lot of similarities to other forms of media that have come before. So we have comic books, we have movies, um, we, we have novels that have, you know, like crime novels. And a lot of these fears, a lot of these concerns were busted. So when we think about parallels to our concerns about games and aggression, when we think about those parallels, it kind of leads us to be like, huh, maybe there's not a there there. But when we think about addiction, it's very different with games. With games, there's a lot of novel factors that other comparison media don't have. Many of the fears are supported, but in, in a kind of weird way. Like, we have anxiety about things like, I don't know, uh, election interference, or the attention economy, or the monetization, you know, the monetization of attention. And they're not really about games or addiction proper, but because they happen on the same device, because these things are kind of intrinsically cross-platform now, our anxieties don't kind of stay with a console the way they might have in the mid-90s. 
So, you know, there, there's definitely a, there's a real qualitative difference between how a parent or a policymaker sees a, a doom sold on CD-ROM in a box in the early 1990s and, and how they see Call of Duty 4 with endless, you know, uh, uh, DLCs and, and added features and dynamic challenge generation. And so the, the, the boundaries of the media are very different. And every time that somebody thinks about the limits or the lack of boundaries on it, it kind of leads them to think, oh my goodness, what else could be happening? So actually, the, the, I, I say this to draw a contrast between the two concerns. They both involve many of the same actors. They involve many of the same kind of stakeholders in society. Um, but they are fundamentally different challenges. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is kind of the philosophical or theoretical underpinnings of addiction. Now, I've heard this a few times. C Celia is great with this. A few others are really great with this, is that we need to be really careful about how we use the term addiction. And uh, we have a common use of it. We, we kind of, it's, it's kind of the same as saying something's fun or it's engaging or it's immersive. But how we react to the word addiction really depends on the thing that we're thinking about, the substance that we're talking about. If we say my loved one is addicted to, to smoking or to heroin or to gambling, that's very different than saying he plays too much golf on Sundays, my teenagers just like can't stop on Instagram or you know, uh, uh, the, the battery keeps dying on the phone because there's so much Fortnite being played. There's something fundamentally different about how we use the word addiction for these things, but in English, we don't have a lot of really good ways of discriminating the two. One way you could discriminate the two, however, is with the off-the-shelf model that we inherit from the medical sciences. So in this model, there's an active ingredient behind different forms of addiction. So for smoking, it's nicotine. For heroin, it's certain classes of opioids. For gambling, people think it's uh, dopamine, but they don't really know. <laughs> we can see things like when you give Parkinson's patients L-dopa and they have more free-floating dopamine in their systems, um, they, they might, for the first time in their lives, become gambling addicts. So there's some treatment effects there, but we're not quite sure. Um, but, but the mechanisms for certain kinds of behavioral dysregulations, things like gaming, things like shopping, um, it's not very clear what the kind of mechanism would be, what the active ingredient might be. But there is kind of, in the way that we practice science on this topic, an assumption that there is some shared kind of commonality. There's some kind of active ingredient that like lives inside of all gambling or lives inside of all sports addiction. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. So uh, with that in mind, with the medical model in mind, uh, uh, all good psychiatrists and epidemiologists begin to build taxonomies. There are basically two you've heard about, I would imagine. Um, the first is the American model from the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, and the second is uh, a model from a working group uh, at the World Health Organization, working with the World Health Organization. Um, the the uh, American model is, um, there was a proposal made for research on a topic of something called internet gaming disorder. Uh, the internet is not defined, and games are not defined, but there is a taxonomy of potential symptoms that are identified. And, and I'll talk about them a little bit more in a little bit. But it is kind of like a, a syndrome without any of the core definitions. I've, I've emailed people asking them very desperately in industry and in academia and psychiatry, what, what the hell is an internet game? Um, and nobody can tell me. The World Health Organization has a more general concept. Uh, it, is, it is called gaming disorder, so it doesn't have the internet in it for any reason. Um, and the basic idea here is instead of having symptoms or, or, or some kind of indicators of what the illness should be, they basically say that it's when you do gaming for a year and across that year you suffer significant impairment to something that's important to you. So it's a bit of a tautology. It's a, bit, it's a little bit of that you know, um, snake eating itself. But um, there's a little disclaimer that says, but if it's really bad, if games are super duper disruptive, then you don't even need to have this problem for a year. And this is basically where we're at right now. Because 
Um, it's, it's a class of argument by analogy, which is to say that we think there might be a problem here. We think there might be an active ingredient. We think that people's lives might be impacted. This might be the cause of a disorder or the cause of ill health. And this is kind of where we are philosophically. All right, so in some ways, gambling disorders are jumping off point, and in some way, uh, different substance abuse disorders are jumping off point. Um, but, but here's really where we're landing. So according to the American Psychiatric Association, essentially, they took the checklist of, of indicators for gambling disorder, and they took out the word gambling, and they put in the word internet gaming. So there are nine possible indicators. I just counted it. Actually, I only put eight on this slide. Um, and uh, the idea is that if you could say yes to five or more of these, then you might be classified as having a problem with gaming. And again, the idea here is that each one of these possible symptoms is it's like equally indicative of you having a problem. Uh, and th that assumption is kind of supported by the fact that, or rather, that assumption is supported by the idea that um, there is something in all games, no matter what type they are, that's analogous to the thing that's inside of all cigarettes, no matter who manufactures them, that is kind of generally addictive for those who might be vulnerable. Does that make sense? All right. So in the third bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about evidence. Um, so as a scientist, I love evidence. As someone who lives in England, I love that my airplane works and gets me here. Um, and also, uh, I'm really interested to know what scientists have been up to for the last 20 years. So depending on what words you use when you look up a literature on video gaming addiction, you can call it disordered gaming, problem gaming, gaming addiction, internet gaming disorder, gaming disorder. You kind of have to write a pretty long search string. Um, there's between 50 and maybe 300 studies on gaming addiction in the last few decades. And they fall into one of basically four tranches. The first is kind of measurement. So if there's a there there, how do we measure it? The second is uh, uh, neuroimaging studies. So in some way, can we learn something about how typical versus non-typical gamers approach games based on something that uh, uh, is a signal that we can detect, detect in an fMRI scanner? <sighs> Symptomatology, these are studies about um, kind of what would gaming disorder be correlated with in the world of psychopathology? How does it kind of fit in the larger, excuse me, in the larger puzzle of, of mental illness? And then uh, treatment. So this is if somebody has a problem, um, how might we help them? All right. So overwhelmingly, the great majority of those 250 studies are measurement studies, all right? So these are large, typically large scale, so maybe between 150 and, you know, our work has upwards of 20,000 participants. Um, and the idea is that using some form of survey research, you cast a, as wide a net as possible within this medical framework, and you try to test if those symptoms or those indicators, uh, if the sniffles and coughs that you think are related to the underlying problem of gaming addiction, if if those are actually present in the population and how good are those questions at discriminating uh, a player who's playing out of a sense of choice and volition from a player who's playing out of a sense of, say, compulsion, uh, feeling like they have to play instead of feeling like they want to play. Um, unfortunately, the great majority of this research uses what's called convenience sampling. So in the rare cases where you actually get gamers who, who have problems with play, it's because the researcher has gone to a, a gaming addiction subreddit. Or they've gone to a part of the internet where, where gamers who have problems regulating their play kind of congregate. And then they conduct this research. And in some ways, this is a bit like researching drug use only outside of a needle exchange. You don't get a very clear sense of how many people in the population have a problem if you're sampling only within certain kind of tranches in certain parts of certain communities. Um, but, but, it, but it is the case that of these 250 studies, or not 250, but of about 200 of these studies, um, really what's going on are these convenience samples. So people are running a thesis, they're doing a project in a high school uh, uh, or a school system, um, or, or they're having friends of friends of friends of friends of friends take surveys. 
The second class of study are, are, are different types of neuroscience studies. These are much, much smaller studies. Um, they have small samples because the amount, of, the amount of money it takes to, it costs like at least $1,700 an hour to give somebody, uh, to prepare someone and then do an fMRI scan. So these studies typically have very small samples, between 10 and 20 people in them. And the basic idea behind all of these studies is they give a large number of gamers in a community a survey. They try to flag the ones that are like low players and high players or the ones they think might have a problem with gaming and the ones that think they think are quote unquote normal, all right? And then they have them do tasks in, in an fMRI where they show them, in many cases, reminders of their favorite game. And then they try to see how much activation there is, relative activation there is between the two groups. And while this doesn't actually tell you anything about addiction, you do observe some differences. And you don't know if that's just because they like the games a whole lot. Um, but there have been many, many studies like this. And, and one of these will come out at least once a month, every month. Um, for the rest of our lives. <laughs> the symptomatology studies. Sorry, I'm getting a bit grim. I should, I should, I should not get grim for another 15 minutes. All right. Um, the, the, the third set is, is much less common than, than it should be, and, and I consider it a very interesting set of study, a, a class of studies, where basically um, people try to figure out if you score high on these questionnaires of gaming disorder, what else do you score high on? Not thinking necessarily that gaming disorder causes these other problems, but how, how do different kind of constellations or how do different kind of clusters of these uh, uh, disorders kind of relate to each other or interrelate? Is gaming in some way a coping mechanism? Is problem gaming in some way a coping mechanism for something that's either organic going on in someone's brain or um, uh, uh, linked to a social environment or some kind of stressor like school. Um, and unfortunately, um, this, is, this kind of research is really hampered by the medical model. So um, there are some gatekeepers in academia who have some very clear ideas about what gaming addiction is and isn't. And so if you kind of come with this kind of open-minded exploratory uh, perspective, um, it's much harder to publish the papers. And um, I don't know how much you know about academic publishing, but it's, it's quite important. Not as important as getting grants, but, but it's up there. Um, does that make sense? All right, I, I, saw, I, I thought I saw a hand. I got really worried for a second there. All right, and then um, by far, thankfully, the rarest class of study are the treatment studies. So these are exceedingly rare. I found three of these, and, and I, I look every few weeks. I have a, I have a search that runs. Um, and in these studies, basically what happens is either there is a behavioral or a pharmaceutical intervention um, with a population of players who are, are either um, self-identify or a therapist has decided they have a problem with games. The typical treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy, which one might think works with a lot of different problems. Um, but I am, I am quite worried from an ethics perspective about um, before we have disorders, a disorder that has real symptoms and a real course of treatment, potential course of treatment, that we're giving people medication uh, for gaming. Does that make sense? So those are the four classes. The, the, the great majority of the studies are these cheap and easy studies where you collect a, a load of participants, you ask them about their favorite hobby, some of them say they have a problem. You do a bunch of statistics. Second is you con a research agency into giving you $250,000 and you scan 30 people's brains and show them pictures of World of Warcraft and Fortnite dances. The third is uh, you kind of do some really cool network science, which I'm sure some people in the room know how to do. Uh, and you try to see how these things constellate over time. And uh, then you have the island of Dr. Moreau. So, if, uh, uh, so when you look at this literature, kind of by and large, the data is actually f fairly low quality. Um, it, 
the studies aren't done very well. There isn't a lot of transparency. Nobody has their hypotheses before they collect their data. You can't see anyone's statistical models because they don't share their code. So there have been a few consortiums of researchers, uh, of which I count myself, where we kind of try to point these things out. We try to say, hey, hold on a second. There are two billion video game players in the world. These 250 studies are kind of garbage. Uh, we're really going out on a limb here. If you're running a health system, this isn't, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't identify a, a new parasite this way. Why, why, are you, why are you talking about a new behavioral disorder? Well, unfortunately, games are very, very popular. So does anyone know what the base rate fallacy is? All right. What if I told you that almost all serial killers wear socks? <laughs> all right. If you didn't know how many people in the general population wore socks, you could interpret this as a pretty good signal that the person, any given person with socks, you don't actually have socks, <laughs> um, is a serial killer. Games are super popular. This means that a giant slice of young people, upwards 95%, depending on how you count, are pretty engaged with some form of game that kind of hits them at the right, they bounce off a bunch of stuff, but it hits them at the right angle, and they find their game for a few months or a few years. So when something bad happens in a young person's life, which is inevitable, there is an unending stream of anecdotal evidence. And this anecdotal evidence, I have to tell you, oh, things are getting grim, uh, is more than enough for this party to stop. <coughs> All right? Um, the, it is true <laughs> that there is actually some evidence of absence, but because the evidence base is so crap, we have to fall back on the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So we don't know what we don't know because research isn't being done properly. And in the meantime, we're going to have monster of the week, scary story. And that's more than enough to motivate regulators. And that's more than enough to motivate people who run the health systems uh, in a way that we would have never seen um, with violence and aggression. So we'll talk a little bit about endgame. All right. This is my most optimistic slide. All right. So I think best case scenario, this party is going to go on for about five more years. All right. So uh, the public, the people who control taxation, and commerce, they're that tiny little boat. Actually, this, this metaphor breaks down the more I think about it. Um, it. I thought I was very clever when I drew this picture, OK? <laughs> I'm just going to go with it. It's an indestructible boat. It's in God mode, OK? So there is a, a level of understanding that the public and policymakers have. They can intuit a whole bunch of stuff about gaming addiction or about kind of the larger halo around games and behavioral dysregulation that are kind of the obvious salient features, right? Very few people like real money transactions. No one likes play to win, uh, pay to win, right? Loot boxes are like, if I ever hear that word again. Um, and antisocial behavior on platforms where people don't take, where, where developers don't take these things seriously and kids come right, rightly to their parents terrified or, or minorly traumatized by a, a uh, irresponsible design decision. Um, there are some things over the surface that, that quote unquote normal people can see that are, that are kind of illnesses in the industry, all right? But as the little boat that's indestructible gets closer to the iceberg, they're gonna be able to see all the other stuff and once they start poking around with regulations, their hands are just going to go into all of these different pies. 
There's a lot of booths around this kind of stuff. I don't know, you should walk around the Expo Center. It's kind of cool stuff. So why is this happening? Why, why is this collision inevitable? Well, there are some things that you don't, that the people in this room don't have a lot of control over, all right? Um, first, generally, there's been a deterioration in the quality of science journalism. So a lot of newsrooms don't have scientists covering science beats anymore because of just things that are happening in that uh, uh, profession. Second, there's been, since the year 2000, there's been a rise in, in what could be called moral entrepreneurs. So these, uh, it's not necessarily morals in terms of right or wrong, um, but it's morals in terms of norms. This is an idea from sociology. So the idea is that there are people who kind of uh, listen to, to the, feel the way the wind is blowing, interpret what the norm is around a technology, and then what they do is they sell that back to us in the form of parenting advice in a, in a kind of a high profile book. And in the, last, in the last two decades, we've gotten this increasingly with social media, with games. Uh, the, does, anyone in, does anyone in the audience, do they, raise your hand if you know who Phil Zimbardo is. This is good. Uh-oh, I, I heard a ringing noise. Somebody didn't listen to my rule about ringing. Okay, it's not my rule. Just give me perfect scores, please. All right. Um, <laughs> I don't care, you can all make noise. I just need the perfect scores. So um, anyway, uh, so some of you had your hands up, let's assume 11%. Um, who knows that Phil Zimbardo wrote a book about video games? One, two, okay, I might have, yeah, we've, we've probably talked, you've talked about it. All right, um, he did. He wrote an entire, Phil Zimbardo, the guy who did the pr Stanford prison experiment, he wrote a whole book about how video games are feminizing boys. This was completely new to me. I read the book. It was, thankfully, it was quite short. Uh, just, type, just, just type zimbardo Shabilsky debate when you have some free time, and, and you can watch what happens. Um, but but there is now a, there's kind of an economic thought leader niche around technology. And so every six or 10 months, it's kind of like, it's kind of like pulling a lever or a loot box. Um, we get a different new technological demon, um, and a lot of them land on games. You don't have a lot of control over that. I do my best as a scientist. Um, there's a lot of technological anxieties in the air. So in the same way that we might be very proud about games being able to play on all of these different platforms, not mentioning any giant company, uh, it's the case that we also do other things on those devices like our email, or our grinder, or our, wait, no, I didn't say that. But uh, we, um, and so in our minds, when we use this device, we have a pretty undifferentiated sense of, of, of what it might do for us or to us. And if games are part of that ecology, that part of that kind of that blurring of our hopes and our anxieties, then what we might think of as an affordance, helping somebody play a game on a platform, it might actually associate our other feelings about arguing on Twitter with our lovely games of Fortnite. And then the final thing is that, and, and this is absolutely true, and I'll speak autobiographically, there are a lot of really bad psychologists out there. There's a lot of bad academics and professors out there, and I can't control their behavior. Uh, and I, I try to call it out when I can, uh, when I have knowledge of it. But your industry has some pretty bad actors in it. And, and they might ruin the party for you. And you don't necessarily have control over that. Um, things you do have control over. <sighs> All right. I've heard the answer to bad speech is good speech, more speech. You just keep pulling that again. You, you just keep finding analogies. Uh, one way you can say is the answer to bad science is good science. The problem is, is there's no good science. And that's partly because it's actually very hard to do good science on gaming addiction because Unlike other things, when you, if you're a researcher and you want to know the effects of nicotine uh, on, on smokers or on, on mammals, you can go out to the store and you can buy cigarettes and you can analyze everything that's in them as a biochemist. All right, and then you can synthesize your own thing and you can run your own study. You actually can't do that with a lot of games because of how they're designed, how they're updated, how the IP is traced and, and taken care of. And so actually, um, 
scientists have a much poorer idea, a, a, a much less enriched idea, of what actually happens inside of games because so much of it is considered IP. So much of it is considered proprietary. So much of it is outside the scope of, um, of scientific inquiry. It's a bit like, um, imagine that you're coming across, it, it's late at night and you come across a drunk and he's looking you know, furtively around at the ground underneath the street lamp. And you say to him, you know, sir, what are you doing? And he says, uh, I'm looking for the keys to my house. And you say, why, did you drop them here? And he says, no, but this is the only place that I can see. What's happening, part of the reason why the literature on, on gaming addiction or on aggression is, is so uh, irredeemable is because you all have the data that's required to actually study it. And what many academic scientists are left with are the scraps. And this is part, I think, in some way of, of two things. The first thing is, a lot, I, I know people in the industry were really burned by the aggression debate. And the First Amendment's basically the reason why we're not having a very different set of conversations right now. Uh, and the second is an on by default defensive posture, a reactive posture. And it's true that things um, are only steadily slightly getting worse every six months. And so area under the curve profit, things are fine. But they are getting irredeemably worse. Uh, there are certain authorities that are looking very closely at regulating. I'm on two in the United Kingdom. Um, and there is blowback. So a few months ago, um, so it's very easy to think of something like the World Health Organization as an organized body that really has its ducks in a row. See, I'm in America, so I can use duck idioms. Um, and uh, they really weren't. They were really internally quite, the, the World Health Organization, they were really quite fraught about this gaming disorder thing. The, the, the people who were working in the ICD-11, they'd really gone out on a limb, all right? And there was a lot of debate internally in the UN. And then the ESA decided to publish a rebuttal to the evidence. And it cherry picked some of my research, just the parts that show games aren't so bad, not the parts that say that people's th thoughts about them being good are also overblown. Cherry picked some stuff about games being great for cognitive development, yada, yada, yada. That's bullshit. <laughs> and then went to town with a press release. And you know what everyone woke up to the next morning in the UN? A circle the wagons moment. So now they're much more convinced that they were right the whole time and you're all evil. I would have warned you not to do that. So my, my piece of advice here is I think you probably all should consider bracing for impact. There are a lot of bad things that can come from this reactive stance, from there not being good science, from there being monster of the week anecdotal anecdata uh, from, from rightfully scared parents. The first is there's going to be stigmatization. We're going to stigmatize a, a hobby of more than a billion people on this planet. The second is that there's going to be a lot of really dumb regulation coming down the pipe. It's going to be inspired, just like the medical metaphor, the medical model metaphor. It's going to be inspired by that. So in the in the EU, we have these. I don't know if they're in America yet. Like these giant packet warnings on cigarettes that show you like a lung that got coughed out of a Dilophosaurus or something. Um, you're going to get that. <laughs> There's going to be, depending on the patchwork of markets and regulations, in some places more aggressive regulators um, are going to fragment the market, the marketplace, and you're going to have certain kinds of labeling rules. There are going to be sin taxes, uh, cost of doing business. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make the violent video game stuff look like nothing. Um, and then there's going to be fines. So there's going to be a lot of compliance, and that's going to have two effects. The, the first effect is it's going to start siphoning giant amounts of money out of your organization. So Google can sustain uh, four and a half billion euros followed by 1.7 billion euros, and they can pay really, really clever lawyers to like, kind of like make that follow a, a diminishing function. I don't know how many gaming companies can sustain, I don't even know if the big boys can sustain more than a few billion dollars of direct fees or fines. And I don't think they can afford to leave the EU market. 
Um, so in a lot of ways, uh, there have been short-term victories that are going to lead to long-term defeats on this. I see someone wearing a Nintendo shirt, and I think Nintendo might be fine, actually. Um, so, you know, what can we do? And I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna intentionally try to end a little early so we can have questions, not comments. Um, what, what, what can you guys possibly do to turn a corner on this and to turn, turn this defeat into an opportunity? You need to be proactive. There needs to be a fundamental shift in your approach to something like gaming addiction or gaming and aggression or whatever. And there'll be other, I promise, there'll be other things that people will make up if addiction ever goes away to be afraid of. Um, this is gonna involve you considering what are your first principles? What, articulate what do you want to be in deve as developers, as responsible citizens and designers of playgrounds for children? This is gonna involve reading human rights law so the UN Council, uh, UN Charter on the Rights of the Child say that young people have a right to information and they have a right to play. And if I have my way, they'll also have a right to play video games and other forms of entertainment when this gets revised, because it's from the late 1980s. But the only way that we get there is if you're at the table. So Lego has ethical design principles for their embodied toys. They check in with those before they build their environments. And I understand that LEGO environments are a little bit more constrained than uh, League of Legends. But, um, but, but they, they've got a touchstone. And, they're all, and the touchstones in this industry are, are rather fragmented. Um, I think that you need to be part of good science. I think you need to promote it. And there's a lot of ways that you can, and I'll, I'll detail some of them in a minute. And I think that you probably need to coordinate because none of you are as big as a Google or a Facebook. Um, and I, I really think that there needs to be, um, in the same way that the free, wait, FAIR? FAIR Play Alliance, sorry. I, I have a sticker, I should check it. Um, but in the same way that the FAIR Play Alliance is trying to articulate a certain set of standards, I think you're gonna need that more broadly um, to answer kind of the big questions of play. So it's not just about reaction. Um, so I'm going to close with this. Um, ooh, um, <laughs> uh, I think you need to foster and model good science. I think that involves in engaging in, in strategic, tactical and strategic data sharing. You need to think about the, the kinds of data that you collect to improve your product or to monetize your product. You need to think about that in terms of how that could be used to improve our fundamental understanding of how billions of people spend tens of billions of hours of every week of their lives, uh, hopefully having fun. This can involve data sharing, hackathons at different levels of education with your data. You get to figure out which kids are really the ones who are you know, potential, potentially hireable. Um, you might consider funding an actual research organization to study play, uh, kind of an extension of what's going on in the UX, UE space, uh, user experience space right now. Think about collaborations with academics when you do them, not as like you bring in you, you, in a petri dish, or not petri dish, but like you bring in a sample of an academic or you share data with just him or her, but actually think about this as more of a team-based activity about joint knowledge production. And uh, I think that really the defensiveness needs to stop or you'll all go extinct. Um, there are things about games that are great, and there are probably things about games that aren't. And I think it's important that we know what those are and we know how, that we're sure about them as we are about our reasons for things like airplanes staying in the air, all right? Because so much of ourselves are invested in these mediums. They're so amazing and we owe it to everyone who plays um, to, to learn as much as we can. And that means we might find some scary stuff but I firmly believe that we, everyone's entitled to their own opinions about art and about this medium, but they're not entitled to their own facts. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you for your time and attention, and please, for the love of God, ask me questions. Um, So uh, 
I'm someone with a deep interest in this to begin with. Uh, I, I work at Valve now as an economist, but prior to that, I spent about 14 years as a social policy researcher. So this is, this is very dear to me, and I, I see what your point is about um, the bad evidence that's out there in the market right now. Um, but, you know, obviously you and, and we are interested in the actual truth about this. And I'm wondering if we, as game companies, are to fund research or do partnerships, especially given that, you know, many game organizations are going to have interests in just showing the positive signs of gaming. Yeah and not the negative. Are we going to be combating bad science that says that gaming is a bad thing yeah. with bad science that says gaming is a good thing? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So, um, and this is not a, a problem that is specific to games or ga the games industry. Um, I think that it is a natural human instinct to want to see the positives of the things that we're most invested in and we love the most. Um, I think fundamentally this comes down to whether or not the money, the data, the resources, the cooperation, whether or not that's contingent on the findings. So in the social sciences more broadly and the medical sciences, there's a movement to something called pre-registration and registered reports. This is the idea that you write down what you're going to do before you do it. And you, or it's peer reviewed before you collect your data. And that's the only way that this will work. So basically, uh, it is a, this is why it requires open mindedness and a certain level of um, letting go of control. Um, because there will be things that, uh, but transparency is the thing that will save us on that. So you may not be able to share the exact data set that comes out of one of these collaborations or the projects, but you can create a simulated data depending on the class of data. Uh, which other people can, can uh, question your code or your models. Um, so well, I'm happy to f follow that up, but uh, yeah. there's a number of people, uh, unless okay. you have one more. Just a very small point. Yeah. I, I agree with everything you said about standards. I'd also advocate for transparency in how data sets are created. Yes. Because that's an important piece of it. Yes, computational reproducibility is something that scientists are horrific at. Thank you. Uh, everyone's horrific at it. You're welcome. Um, I think there, and then I'll alternate, okay. or not alternate, obviously. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I find that uh, when we act as advocates for games and uh, ambassadors of our industry, and we have to defend ourselves against um, things like the internet gaming disorder classification and the certain kinds of studies, that, uh, the bad science studies, uh, I find there's a real danger and um, tendency to dip into dogmaticism and in some cases come off as anti-intellectualism. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you recommend, uh, especially if we are not uh, scientists or psychologists, how do we sort of avoid coming off that way? Um, I think curiosity is the thing that's missing. So um, one, of the, one, one of the real tragedies of, you know, both of, the, of concern focused research in, in psychological science and, and in these other sciences is that there's actually a very low level of curiosity or interest in what the hell games are. And so when I was training as a scientist, um, I wanted to do studies on motivation. And so the way I learn is through examples. And so I'd have to read other lab studies. And it really ground me down, the lack of curiosity. And so um, I, I think remembering that you're not going to lose your job if you listen to a parent who's flustered um, or trying to identify if the person has, try, try to identify what their interest or where their passion comes from for arguing with you. Um, and I think that the insights you get, I mean, it's very banal. When you get to the moral entrepreneurs, who are their whole reason for being is to sell a book and a consultancy, et cetera, et cetera, you do not need to listen to those. You can, you're, please feel free to argue with them. But um, I think a lot of people um, just don't have a lot of clarity on, on what exactly they're unhappy about. I hope that helps. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Hey, <clears throat> sorry. Um, what do you think is the, resp the responsibility of conferences like GDC that host talks that teach dark patterns and promote the attention economy? Um, I think in the first instance, um, we need to understand the, the reasons why those things either work or don't work on a very thorough level. So you talk to say, um, 
Tristan or these guys who are doing the time well spent movement. You know, they're kind of like, they, they've come to their fa found Jesus moment. They've decided that when they worked at Google, they were evil because they manipulated people. And now they've realized that that was wrong and now they'll help, right? Um, but when you ask them about the research that underlies their thinking that they were these kind of Oppenheimers of social control, um, they point at studies that are garbage from the social sciences. Like there's this, there was a Cornell professor, uh, uh, Brian Wansink, who like had this unending soup bowl experiment, but he's a fraudster. The experiment never worked. And these guys who think that they've, you know, fooled the world, you know, it's possible they still did, but the, the evidentiary basis for their claims, for good or bad, are kind of based on a whole series of assumptions. So I get tricked by dark patterns. It makes sense to me that that happens. Um, but I think that the first duty of, of an organization uh, is to actually um, document the phenomena closely. Because if we regulate it without understanding it, or if we kind of set rules about it without understanding it, um, you know, it's a dinosaur's amber scenario. Uh, is that good? Yeah, thanks. All Appreciate right. it. Hi, hello. Um, so regarding the iceberg me metaphor oh God. analogy. Uh, it's a very strong boat, okay? It's moving yeah. quickly. Well, uh -huh. my question is, why do you think that the, the boat will catch up with the iceberg? Because as it seems to me, like you said, every six months something new comes up. Uh -huh. So what do you make you believe that the regulators will actually catch up? Because they haven't <laughs> been able to catch up. I mean, that's a... Uh, I don't know. For a while. Um, so I have two answers. One is is polluted by my own experience, which is that I had years of my life where I wasn't unparliamentary. I wasn't giving evidence to parliamentary subcommittees on these topics, and now an increasing amount of my time is spent doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just a matter of historic record that you know different companies and countries, different countries are looking more closely at these mechanics now. Um, so is your question, is it happening, or why is it happening? I mean, will they ever catch up? Because yes. like, it seems to, well, but we are developing new ways how what, to what they'll do, what get they'll the do, attention of the player. Right, so what they'll do is they'll write a rule that is, oh, I just remembered the second part of an answer that I didn't give. Uh, they'll write a rule that is like a catch-all rule, and then when a company that's large enough to step out of line, steps out of line, they'll sue it, right? Or they'll, they'll, they'll levy a fine. And sorry, and that was the other thing I wanted to say, that it's not just the companies can't sustain these fines, it's that the cost of compliance is very high. So it may cut out smaller studios from certain markets. Um, and then that's a real opportunity cost for human play. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Thanks. I mean, we could talk more about that. It's really boring, uh, reg regulatory frameworks uh, for me. Hi. Hi. Uh would you say that screen addiction ties into video game addiction at all, or is that similar in that it is not entirely properly studied or even uh, it's, an, it's entirely the same thing. Is it? Yeah, so um, you just take out, literally you can just take out the word video game and you can put in smartphone, screen, social media. It's all the same kind of uh, uh, miasm of social science. So the fundamental problem is that uh, it's large scale social data from surveys. And so because one person fills out the survey, uh, everything that they reply to has kind of a background level of correlation. And so things like I use a screen a certain number of hours a day and I feel sad, those things share one third of 1% of covariance. And if you just, if all you care about is a p-value, if all you care about is statistical significance, then you can say something scary. But I work by uh, Amy Orban and I on screen impacts, um, you will overdose on that if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I can actually do the next two in the next three minutes if they're yeah. reasonable. Yes. Uh, um, when it comes to the sort of like research organization, are there any good examples in other industries where that's actually been not a defensive <laughs> thing? Because everyone I'm aware of is a super defensive, like makes it worse kind of organization. Yeah, I don't know. So I think in my mind the model is a there's something called the Psychological Science Accelerator, which is a, a coalition of hundreds of psychology labs all around the world. And we all run the same experiment at the same time. 
And that way we know what we find is either there or not there, psych science accelerator. Um, unfortunately, all of the collaborations that I'm aware of between the gam uh, gambling gaming industry, that one, uh, and different kind of health organizations and governmental organizations, those have all failed. Uh, pretty in different ways, though, spectacularly in different ways. So they're they're use cases, but um, but yeah, I'm I'm writing a, a white paper on how it not how it cannot be a dumpster fire, um, and so it should work with Facebook too. I hope. Okay. All right. One last one. Good. Uh, are you from Rochester? I am. I'm nice. from Yonkers. But oh I go to well, no one's Rochester. perfect. Yeah. Uh, so you talked a lot about. Um, I really like the slide where you uh, you were talking about like when you're addicted to like drugs, it shows yeah. up. And like I think it's it really hit a note where like we're trying to isolate this X, right? Mm -hmm. This X that is video game addiction. And let's say 20, 30 years from now, every one of us in this room knows exactly what makes a game addicting, right? Mm -hmm. We found X. Yeah. And I really think that at that point in time, there's going to be a lot of companies, which I won't name names, that want to be the Marlboro of games. They don't care yeah. about morality. They just want to make addicting games so people play them. And there's yeah. going to be a lot of people who just want to make fun games that are the opposite of whatever this X is, right? Yeah. And so how do you think that as you know, a community, we can deal with something like that? Because I feel like that would literally tear like the entire games industry right. to pieces. So this is, this is where I, I return to my facts versus opinions thing. So um, if we actually have good scientific evidence, scientific evidence that this thing is an opioid, you know, let's just imagine it's, it's a horrible, addictive thing. Yeah. Right? It's, a, it's kryptonite to children, uh, but addictive kryptonite. What um, I think that if we have clarity on it, if we have the facts on it, it'll be very, very easy to regulate. Okay. And, and it's not going to be up to mom and pop game studio on a, I don't know, they're going to make like 3D augmented body suits in this future that you have. But um, it's not going to be up to, to you to police them. Uh, I think that if we, if we have a, a common set of facts, it'll be ridiculously easy to, to regulate them. OK. All right. All right, I think that that is time. Uh, and um, I thank you all for your time and attention. I don't know what the scale is, but if it's a 10-point scale, you give me a 10. And if it's an 8, an 8. All right? All right, thank you so much.